Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. It can be a beautiful experience sometimes to sit back and listen to two great minds musing on some of the biggest questions of life. Even when their conversations feel a bit beyond our grasp, they point to deeper realms and invite us to journey with them into a richer intellectual life. That's exactly what we have for you today. Two of the great intellectuals in the Latter-day Saint world, Terrell Givens and John Durham Peters, invite us to drop in on a conversation between good friends, a conversation that ranges across a variety of fascinating topics. John Durham Peters is a professor of English and professor of film and media studies at Yale University. A media historian and social theorist, he authored the acclaimed book, Speaking into the Air, A History of the Idea of Communication. His other books include Courting the Abyss and The Marvelous Clouds. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Terrell Givens, sponsored by Faith Matters. I am here with uh, one of my beloved friends and uh, um, an academic whom I just highly admire and love talking to because uh, he has such a, a lively and engaging mind. His name is John Durham Peters. He's the Maria Rosa uh Menachal professor of english and a film Menachal. it's Menachal. okay yeah <laughs> uh, the Menachal professor of english and a film and media studies at uh yale um that's fairly recent right you've been there just a few years you came from four and a half years, years yeah four and a half years that long came from an from an endowed chair at iowa uh we we can't seem to arrange ourselves so that we're on the same half of the continent at the same time <laughs> but uh He's, uh, well, as I mentioned, expert in media studies. You're, you're quite prolific. You've written a number of books, um, some of which I have read more thoroughly than others. Uh, I myself was um, deeply influenced and moved by, I think it was your first book, 1999, Speaking into the Air, a kind of history of communication, but a lot more interesting and engaging than that uh, category can sound to some people outside of media studies. And uh, then you you did uh, another one on Courting the Abyss. Um, mm-hmm. That was a few years later. And then you did uh, The Marvelous Clouds, which mm-hmm. got a lot of fanfare at, for its ambitious uh, history of everything that you managed to subsume within the rubric of media. Um, and then most recently, just last year, you did uh, Promiscuous Knowledge, which you kind of co-wrote with your friend uh, Kenneth Camille. And uh, I'm working my way through that one, but it's a really it's a, yes, I am. Wow, you're in a rare group. And uh, <laughs> it's a do not publish a book in March 2020. Yeah, that's well. One would have thought maybe that people didn't have anything else to do except read uh, <laughs> during these days of COVID. But uh, so we're going to be talking today about a range of topics. You are um, generally referred to in reviews as a polyglot you uh your media studies you kind of do intellectual history you do some philosophy you manage to weave theology Mm -hmm. into much of what you do and so i'm hoping to maybe intersect with many of those boundaries today Mormonism contains all truth there you go as a teenager with brigham young and i thought let's do this thing yeah well that's one thing i i love about your interview style um uh, I'm thinking, for example, of the LA Times review, which was a quite extensive review of your book, The Marvelous Clouds. And the way you introduce Mormonism and Mormon theology into the conversation, it's never gratuitous, uh, it's never forced or evangelistic. You have a very sincere and well rooted way of seeing Mormon theology as interconnected with so many uh, other disciplines and ideas. And I noticed that in the LA Times and elsewhere, they often don't pick up the ball and run with it. Right, yeah, they don't. <laughs> they just pass that over in silence and go on to the, to the next question. Is that a lateral? No, that was a fumble. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, gee, there's so many places we could start for a point of departure, but, but I'm going to just pick one kind of arbitrarily. Can I do that? Right. That comes out of your LA Times uh, interview. And LA Review of Books, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, LA Review of no Books. yeah. And um, you, a theme that you, you tend to go back to occasionally, I, I, I think you, this was an important part of your speaking into the air, was an attempt to kind of demystify or de-romanticize mm-hmm. a lot of our ideas about the past and, and in that book about communication and, and interrelatedness and romantic mm-hmm. love. 
-hmm. And you kind of come back to that that theme in this recent book, insofar as you know, everybody's writing books about about the the, the technology glut and you know the mm. information deluge. You, you set yourself apart by t- taking rather novel approaches to a tired theme, and one way you do that um, is evident in these words. So I'm just going to read a few sentences from your interview. You say the philosophy of technology is often infected by a romanticism that sees technology as a loss of an elemental relation to the cosmos, and that we tend to be deluded with conceptions of original purity. And then you ask, why would we want to go back to Eden? Living in a world rich with objects and subjects is a step forward, an opportunity, especially if we embrace the covenants that moor our sometimes errant ship. Here, my Mormonism, you say, with its materialist metaphysics, media-friendly theology, affirmation of this worldly embodiment as a step toward divinity, and rigorous sense of responsibility for choice surely shines through my philosophy of technology. So I, I'd love to hear, I mean, I've read right a good bit on it, but I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about this a bit more for our audience. Um, because you're not infatuated with technology in the way that you know many of the millennials are just kind of you know addicted to it. So what do you mean? How might we reevaluate our relationship to technology and its role in our lives? Great, great question. You know, um, the epigraph to the marvelous clouds is Alma thirty-seven six, which I don't know if anybody. It's also an epig- There's an epigraph from Emerson. There are there are two epigraphs from my two favorite books from the 1830s, basically. Um, You know, basically, you know, that God works by means. Means are media. So what would it mean if we took seriously the idea that God uses techniques or technologies? And for me, this this contrast is important, actually, because I do think that um, technique is something which is primordial in human being and perhaps divine being, that we need help, that we're materially embedded in environments. We are placed in that sphere to act freely, you know, according, you know, from section, uh, section 93, why wouldn't a divine life also be one of means? Technology, I think is something different because it necessarily implies a kind of gadget, you know, a, um, a kind of material, Quality. And this is why in chapter two of, the, of that book, uh, The Marvelous Clouds, they talk about whales and dolphins who are presumably highly intelligent and presumably full of techniques of politicking and singing and, and you know, raising families and ethics and so on, but without technologies because their world prohibits any kind of uh, engineering, any kind of infrastructural engineering. So, yeah. So, so part of what you're doing is you're, you're, you broaden definitions in a way. Yeah. Sometimes people push back, right? Yes, absolutely. Like uh, the marvelous clouds. Nobody thinks of clouds as a form of media. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to me that what you're doing is to say, well, there are at least two different ways that meaning can be constituted. One is through intentionality, mm-hmm. a kind of system of signs that we engage right. in self-consciously. Yes but that other natural phenomena, we also interpret because they they have meanings. They they are pointers to to other realities. Right. Yeah, we can read that which was never written. And there's a lot to read out there. I mean, books are written, but so are clouds, so are leaves. So is the history of the cosmos. And, you know, if, if we, you know, Charles Sanders Peirce is a, is a thinker who's very important to me. And, you know, he talks about continuity in which he basically thinks there's a continuity of intelligence from what he calls slime mold, or in other words, protoplasm up, up to God. And, and, and this just resonates very, very deeply with me. Maybe it's reading, reading Orson Pratt um, as a teenager or something that, that, but that it's sort of pan psychist idea that, that objects are, are imbued and alive uh, with intelligence and that the whole world is sort of, I mean, this is Walter Benjamin's metaphor, but the whole world is mute because of the fall. It should be singing, but we still have to figure out how to translate it. You know, we, we have to understand how, how to read the cosmos. 
and that this is part of our, you know, section 88 is, is full of, of this kind of suggestion, of course, you know, that the earth rolls upon its wings. Yeah, and there's been a there's been a striking turn in this direction, hasn't there, on the part of philosophers and cosmologists and theorists of consciousness. I'm thinking of Thomas Nagel. I'm thinking of Stuart Kaufman, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and and others who who are suggesting that that matter seems to to follow certain principles of self organization. Yeah. That there seems to, if not, you know, fully sentience or, or, or consciousness, but there is some kind of intelligence at work that seems to be moving in the direction of always greater intelligence, so greater kind of yeah. amalgam right. of right. these elements. Yeah. So Purse's yeah. Purse's great word is evolutionary love, oh, which is which is an, a direct attack upon the kind of social Darwinist or social Manchesterian or Spencerian. Sorry, this is all, I'm teaching a class in the 19th century next semester. So this is all, all, all in my head. Yeah. But the, the kind of brutal reading of Darwin, Peirce says, no, you know, let's think about evolutionary love. Let's, let's think about the highest achievement of evolution as thirdness, as connection, as interpretation, connection, love. So that, uh, that, that kind of corresponds rather nicely with certain ideas in the King Follett discourse, right? Very much so. <clears throat> that's, Very much so. That's the point of the song. So so tell me, how does your project, how is it influenced by and how is it different from the kind of 19th century project of, of natural theology that also wants to read all of creation as kind of emblematic of, of God and his nature? Yeah, I, such a such a good question because you know I'm torn somewhere between someone like Charles Babbage. Um, who has this amazing treatise, a theological treatise from 1838, in which he basically says that the whole universe, even the air, is a library of everything that's ever happened. You know, he's been reading his, his buddies with Laplace, the um, mathematician, and he believes in infinitesimal vibrations and such that we could actually, if we could travel fast enough and far enough, we could reconstruct the eye of omniscience is, um, is his idea, that we could reconstruct everything um, that happened. So Babbage on the one side, Herman Melville on the other side um, with Moby Dick, and in which it's sort of, un, you know, the universe may have a meaning, but who's the person in that novel who really wants to figure out what the universe means? It's Ahab. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of frantic manic quest, and he, you know, he thinks he's got it figured out, and, and that there's a kind of, you know, looming malevolence in the cosmos embodied um, in the white whale. And you know, Ishmael, the narrator of Moby Dick, of course, is is much more agnostic, and you know, so the, you know that agnosticism seems really quite appealing um, in um, in many ways. I mean, it's Alma with uh, with Korihor. I mean, you know, the Alma's evidences which he offers are not ones which are totally binding; they're ones which re require the will and the interpretive fortitude or the interpretive. Uh, will, I guess, is, is the right word, um, of the reader. So, yeah, I guess I'm stuck somewhere between the universe singing out in all of its glory and the sort of ultimate breakdown of our ability to read it well. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me see if I can <clears throat> pull a couple of these th threads together to pose another question. <clears throat> it, it seems to me like Emerson is a profound influence um, Absolutely. on your thinking as well. And I'm thinking too of his, what I thought was a brilliant, in his, his essay on nature, a brilliant kind of critique of this false dichotomy between nature and civilization, right? Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. are we doing anything different when we build a skyscraper than a beaver is when it builds its lodge, right? So there's a kind of collapse yeah. of those polarities. There's, which, which is also related to his, his critique also of a kind of you know, faux primitivism, this, this sense mm -hmm. that, we, that we want to get back to this pr pristine purity before civilization despoiled it. Now, I want to see if I can put this into a kind of theological context, mm -hmm. right? Because it seems that part of what you're resisting here is a kind of typ typically Calvinist outlook on, mm -hmm. on life as a kind of undeviating declension from a, a, a primordial innocence. And, and it seems to me that you're combining both a kind of evolutionary outlook with a kind of Mormon, right, forward-looking, theosis-oriented kind of, 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 of modality to suggest that we, 
and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I'm all, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. it's already pretty well known that this is part of my project. But right, would I be right. correct in saying that part of what you're trying to do as well is to divest us of a kind of Protestant overlay to the way we read history that you think uh, works in negative ways? Yeah, I mean, there, there is no primal purity. Um, we, we come into the world technical beings, social beings, connected beings. So the idea, yeah, but I don't know. And I'm still thinking about Calvinism and um, if that fits or not. And I'll give a historic, I mean, a brief historical point. I went on my mission in the Netherlands. And so I spent part of it in deeply Catholic territory. And the typical answer we would get when we knocked on people's door was, ich bin katholikus, which means something like, I'm Catholic, so go away, or, or Catholic. And you, know, and, you know, we would, you know, we were appalled. And this was our sort of, you know, Mormon Protestantism coming through that they wouldn't know or care about their theology. You know, that, that they wouldn't see this as a kind of literate intellectual project. But then we got, I mean, I got transferred to the Calvinist zone. And I mean, this was really, really in, um, in, intense. And, and I didn't know which one I liked better or liked worse. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is you know, one of my favorite authors is a Calvinist. Um, you probably like her too, Marilyn Robinson. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so I mean, she and her a project, she's not really a Calvinist. She, she says she's a Calvinist, but you know, I mean, you know, she, her, her whole point is, is to write, try to redeem Puritanism from its slur right. of being right. anti-worldly, anti-natural, anti-embodied, anti-pleasure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, these, these categories are tricky, but I mean, absolutely. I'm, i I lose interest really past, fast when I hear people whinging about, you know, why can't we just go back to Eden? I mean, it just, it, I, I just have this like reflex that I can't stop myself. From well, well, there's, there's another crazy. interesting theological intersection yeah. here that I think you're, you're, you're contesting. And that is, you know, we have an article of faith that talks about, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, right? Um, and so we, you know, I'd much rather talk about we believe in the same impulses and inclinations <laughs> that existed in the primitive church. I think those are far more important, but we tend to overread that article of faith, don't we? And so that's part of what creates a, not, not just a, a sentimental, but a theological nostalgia for a, a past that never existed, right. because the church wasn't as full blown and developed. And, you know, um, my favorite contemporary theologian is probably David Bentley Hart and really? uh, who can be, it can be incredibly caustic. Um, yes, he's Mr. Caustic. Yeah, all theological values matter to him except kindness. But um, <laughs> but he's written recently on this theme where he says we have to move beyond this. Uh, in fact, it, I just happened to have this. I posted it on my wall. I, I, I like it so well. So can I just read some of this and then yes, have, you, yeah. have you comment on this? He said, the configuration of the old Christian order is irrecoverable. And in many ways, that is for the best. But the possibilities of another, perhaps radically different Christian so social vision remain to be explored and cultivated. Uh, in its first, uh, he says, Christian thought can always return to the apocalyptic novum of the event of the gospel in its first beginning and drawing renewed vigor from that inexhaustible source, imagine new expressions of the love it is supposed to proclaim to the world and new ways beyond mm -hmm. the impasses of the present. See, it seems to me that when Joseph Smith uses the word restoration, right, uh, and to this day you find many religious historians who categorize Mormonism as a restorationist tradition, mm -hmm. in, 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 right, in the tradition of, of, of Campbell and Stone and, right. and others, and I think nothing could be further from the truth, hmm. because typical restorationism was all about reduction. We go right. back, we strip, we refine. And Joseph Smith was, no, we go forward, we expand, we, right. we add. And so um, I, I'm just ha happy to hear you express these kinds of thoughts because it seems to me to give uh, added emphasis to the need to shift our focus forward rather than backward in these, these nostalgic ways. Um, yeah. So. Nostalgia is a trap, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, 
it, it is, and it can be paralyzing and, you know, it's, it's, it's counterproductive, I think, to the project of a continuing restoration. Right. I mean, my, my favorite absurd example is Nephi on the tower in, uh, in Helaman, which he says, if I could only have lived in the days of <laughs> Lehi and Nephi, I mean, yeah. come on, did, yeah. did, did, I mean, he obviously didn't read the text or didn't read it very well. Exactly. Maybe he didn't have, have access to the, to the small plates. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, well in, here's, it seems to me there's a parallel theme here too, then that has to do with how, how exactly do we envision that future? So it seems mm -hmm. that, that as, as Mormons, we're kind of caught between right, skill and cryptus, because on the one hand, we look back and we get all nostalgic and sentimental, and we look forward and we get all ap apocalyptic yeah. and, and, and horrified by the specter of this destruction. And you've, you've written that you think we may need to rethink exactly what, what, uh, what our vision of the end time, the end game should yeah. be. So, so can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple directions I, I want to go because um, in the past year and a half, we've all been involved in reckonings of various kinds in which you have a kind of reverse nostalgia in which we're able to, to uh, see the past as a kind of iniquitous DNA, which continues to, to uh, uh, determine us. So, I mean, that's something I, I'd be interested um, in thinking about um, a bit. Um, in the book that I'm trying to write, but not really writing, um, I'm trying to, it's about weather and it's about climate. And, you know, one of the questions is, are there other ways of thinking about climate change that are besides the apocalyptic? Because apocalypse, as you well know, is a literary genre, um, which comes, comes together with certain kinds of expectations and themes in the same way that, you know, the genres we tend to use for thinking about the future um, tend to be apocalypse, or especially the future of climate change or pastoral or tragedy. Could, could we think comedy? You know, comedy is about regeneration. You know, and, and the Marvelous Clouds does end with a kind of dark comedy in saying, you know, that, you know, we humans may not exist anymore, but the planet's gonna keep chugging. You know, so I mean, I mean that there is gonna be, you know, whatever happens, there's gonna be some kind of new forms of life. You know, the, the cockroaches are gonna survive. They can survive anything. Um, so, I mean, there's, I don't know, what are the genres we can use to think um, about the future and what are the theological tools that we can, that we have to think about really complicated pasts? Because, you know, this nation and this church has been doing a lot of work to think um, about its past. And I'm not sure that we're always doing it very productively. Yeah. Well, this may take us down a detour. We don't want to go, but, but, but you, you raised in my mind the question of transhumanism. Mm. And um, you know, it's it's been noted by more than one person that that Latter Day Saints seem to be the only religious denomination that is represented to a significant degree among <laughs> transhumanist <laughs> communities and organizations, right? And so, for those who don't know what we mean by transhumanism, maybe you could go ahead and and and, and fill in a, a, a definition there. But I'm just wondering what with with the kind of revisionist appreciative approach you take to technology and, and media. Um, how, how would you identify yourself relative to transhumanist kind of impulse? I think I'm skeptical. I think I'm skept skeptical because it seems that part of, I mean, not that I understand it well enough. Um, I was invited to speak at one of their conferences and, and that got uh, you know, canceled because of, because of COVID. Um, but, you know, I think finitude is absolutely essential and that mortality is a gift. And as I understand transhumanism, it's that we should mobilize the wonderful tools that we have, whether to prolong or even find um, eternal life. And, you know, death, I think we have to kind of um, embrace. Uh, the, the Marvelous Clouds ends with Socrates, Jesus, and, and Confucius. Um, as the, my three heroes, all of whom refused to write, all of who refused a certain kind of technology, a technology of prolongation, of extension of life, and nonetheless lived on because of the work of their disciples. I mean, all their, their message was all, don't fear death. And so, I mean, not, I mean this may not be fair to transhumanism and, and uh, Tamara Kanis and my son, Benjamin Peters have actually written a really interesting piece 
about Mormon transhumanism um, so that they know more. Okay, well, well, what you've said just brings to mind another um, marvelous provocative statement of yours. It just happens to be absolutely apropos what you just said. You said, you know, many have written on the, the danger of cognitive deterioration, right? We're so reliant now on, on forms of technology. We don't have to learn much for ourselves. Google is an extension of the brain. And then you say, but something more insidious, a kind of existential deorientation is, is at work in which presumptions of universal storage alter our relation to loss and death. So um, you, you, remind, you remind me in saying that of, of a statement made by an atheist friend of mine once. We were talking in collegial conversation about the possibility of life after death. And he said, well, I think that one has to believe in the absolute finality of death to give any value to the life that is bookended yeah. that way. So, so I see there's a kind of logic to that. Mm. Um, and yet I, I wonder, does anybody really believe that? Really? I mean, you mean, there's, a, that, that, there's Martin Hegelund up there. This life makes that precise argument. I don't know if you know this, this, this book, my Yale colleague. I don't. Yeah. Well, you, you seem to be not going quite that far. But you're, no. But you're saying something like that, right? Something that approaches that. In that there is there there is um, there's the necessity to recognize our finitude, right? In a way that puts more value on the transient and and the and the provisional. Is that is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, who knows what's um, what's uh, beyond the grave? I, I I love walking around cemeteries. There's a lot um, in New Haven, and finding funny gravestones. I found one that said stone. I found one that said Mortel, but my favorite one was one that said Vavice. This was, um, <laughs> this was if, if you pronounce the way, it wasn't exactly two words like in German, but in German, that means who knows. Right. Um, and I, I thought that, you know, Thomas Hobbes said you know, famously that the gravestone is the ultimate philosopher's stone. You know, and, and, and that we, you know, and Hannah Arendt, of course, said, let's not think about death, let's think about birth, a, a kind of great, you know, feminist or proto-feminist uh, rejoinder to the boy philosopher's obsession with death. But, you know, there is something sweet ab about finitude. I mean, there's that old Scott Card story about the aliens who come around and hang around cemeteries because they find it so beautiful that these mortals can die because they're stuck, you know, they can't die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, let me let me shift gears just a little bit. We 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 have just a few minutes left, and I want you to to speak to what I thought were some of your more profound and and transformational insights uh, in terms of the way they affected my relationships that come from speaking into the air. And it's where you you de you, you demythologize romantic love, right? Uh, I think as a as a young starry starry eyed. Um, teenager or, or post-teenager, right? I always thought there was something beautiful about the, the Latter-day Saint conception of eternal marriage that posited in, in, in Erastus Snow's vocabulary, right? A kind of existential combinatorial, right? Essence that you come to constitute as a, as a man and woman. You become a new being, mm -hmm. not beings. And that notion of becoming completely one, completely united, right? Uh, I think probably <laughs> wasn't the healthiest way in which to <laughs> to a marriage relationship because one or the other has to submit, right? And so you give a very different account of love across difference. Can you just say a few things about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in some ways marriage itself done right is the great critique of romantic love uh, because it takes you to something better. Um, I love the word cleave, cleave unto. Yeah. Cleave means to divide and it means to join. And, and, and I, th I think that's the great word for, for marriage because it's precisely, I mean, it's the scandal of difference which can seem so agonizing when there's some kind of misunderstanding. You know, it can seem like this eternal gulf uh, between hearts and, you know, the poets have been lamenting that forever. But 
On, on the other hand, what a cacophony would be if we had to listen to each other's half-baked thoughts before they were filtered through, through language and reflection and reason and kindness and, and so on. So I mean, this idea that you know, telepathy, you know, a kind of instantaneous fusion of our hearts would be a good thing. No, thank you. I don't want my stupid unfiltered thoughts. I mean, it's, I mean, it's hard enough. I mean, James is great on this, the book of James, you know, that, that the tongue is so, so unruly. You know, I've said stuff which were not properly filtered and have lived to regret it in marriage and um, in, in, other, in other ways. And if I didn't have that shield of, of processing my being through the materiality of embodiment and language and existence and time and, you know, the, the household flow and all the things that we're um, engaged in, that makes marriage much richer, I think. Yeah. Rather than you know dreaming of of you know a Vulcan mind melt. I mean, heaven forbid. I don't I don't want Doctor Spock <laughs> you know, right, extracting right. mining all of my deep dark thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Well, as long as you call that a yeah, sentimental yeah. view of love yeah. and, and not a romantic view of love, because that's and, and you mean romantic in the colloquial sense, right? Because you know in romanticism itself, right? There's this interesting critique of that that I think underlies. Okay. The, the prevalence of the theme of incest, right? It's it's as if what they're saying is, if you keep projecting yourself onto the other, that's ultimately what you're what you're tending towards. You see it in Mary Shelley, and you see it in Lord Byron, you see it in Charlotte Brown, you, you see it you everywhere. Do. There. Yeah. And so I don't know if they were conscious of that, but at some level, I think they were saying no. Yeah. The difference is essential to to this healthy. I mean, Hegel Hegel in his phenomenology, you might remember this passage when he's saying that the love of brother and sister is the is the highest form. Uh, no, <laughs> but, but, but be, because because it lacks desire, right? Because, right. because there there is no desire there, and then he starts tripping on on Antigone, of course, right. which which was which was the great drama of the nineteenth century. Yeah. Oedipus is the great drama of the twentieth century. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's clear that the the uh, romantics uh, are actually much smarter than we give them credit for uh, for being. I mean, they're the ones who recognize that this is all, it's all breaking down and, and, and they make poetry out of it. I mean, that's that's the great lesson. You discover breakdown, you don't mope. Yeah. You, you make poetry. You right. write an ode, ode to dejection. You just don't go moping around. Yep. You do something with it. That's yeah. 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 that's a lesson for us as, as married or as, as humans connected with other humans. I mean, you know, marriage is maybe the most intense form, but certainly not the only. Right. Well, I love your image of, of difference is what creates the gap across which the spark can ignite. Right. And uh, yeah, that became really pivotal. So thank you for, for that. Um, John, do you have any, any concluding thoughts before we wrap up? Anything um, that we've left unsaid that you wish we had addressed? Um, I want to talk about my talk about the Constitution. All right. If we just, get cut off, just, we get cut off. But let's give it a try. I think we've got five minutes left. Just a um, member of the bishopric invited me to, uh, to give a talk, um, essentially a Fourth of July talk, the last Sunday of, of June on the Constitution, and assigned me some reading from President Oaks. And you know, th there are a bunch of discoveries. Um, but the main discovery was we officially believe the Constitution to be an inspired document. And yet the Constitution was a profoundly flawed document because right. it, it endorsed slavery. It actually awarded money via taxation and representation to slave states. And it excluded women uh, from voting. So race and gender, two of the great sins that our nation um, has, has been involved in. And yet how do, do we recognize that to have been inspired. And I think this, this discovery that inspiration does not preclude imperfection, which may not even be a strong enough word, like, you know, grotesque, you know, abuse, you know, I mean, there's no other word that yeah. for, uh, for that than, uh, than slavery. How could that be uh, inspired? And I think that to me is, is a really rich way of a, a kind of applying um, an atonement theology to think about history and the crimes of history. Because, you know, I re recently read uh, Isabel Wil Wilkerson on Cast, which is a very compelling read, but all of her metaphors are determinist. It's DNA, it's, it's, um, it's botanical, you know, whatever happened, 
that slavery is still happening now. You know, and it's, um, it's, it's compelling, but I also think that, you know, there are other ways of thinking about the past as amnesty without amnesia, to use the famous words of Adam Michnik, the, the Polish journalist and political theorist. So anyway, there, there are lots of directions we could go. We, uh, we don't have time, but I think this is quite fruitful in terms of thinking um, about the church's very complicated racial racist past. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we can book another conversation. Okay, maybe we'll do that because because the, the 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 comment that you made in passing that deserves an hour itself is is how this ties to the atonement and that the, and that the atonement can substantively change the past. Exactly. That's the whole. That's the whole infinitude of it seems to me right. the atonement is it has. Capacity. It changes the past and it binds the future. I mean, that's the. We think of the future as open ended. We think of the past as fixed, and right. the atonement flips that. That's right. the that's one of the many marvels of it. Right. Well, John, I'm definitely going to have you back. And uh, okay, appreciate maybe in person. Who knows? I hope so. I hope so. But thanks so much for spending your time with us today. Well, it was a real pleasure. Thanks for such great questions and kind words, and thanks for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Taro Givens and John Durham Peters. As always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read every review and so appreciate the way it helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters. Thanks again for listening and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.